greetings brothers and sisters and uh, we praise the lord for this afternoon giving us uh, liberty to worship him on his sabbath and uh, we don't we don't take this uh, moment for granted but uh, as an opportunity to understand and recognize that the Lord has added probation on our lives so that we may show forth his glory. And uh, I want us to continue with the series on justification. This is part 17. We left uh, in the last subject in the last presentation number 16 the two adams where we looked at the nature of adam first adam and uh, second adam and uh, now we want to look to go more uh, on the same in the next six presentations we shall be looking at uh, the aftermath of 1888 and the nature of jesus christ and so I'll be continuing to present on the history of the church and uh, see what the Lord is speaking to us and restore this message that has been lost. And so I'd like us to pray as uh, we begin this evening presentation. Our Lord and our Father, which art in heaven, thank you so much for thy grace. Thank you for thy marvelous love in giving Jesus Christ the comforter. I do pray that uh, you may continue speaking to our hearts, that uh, we may refine again our identity which has been lost. I thank you because this you will do, not because of anything grievous or anything good we have done, but because of the love that you have for the human race. And so speak to us in the tenderest voice in Jesus' name. Amen. And so once again, I say welcome. And I'd like just to continue in the history Minneapolis 1888 and now in the previous segments around 10 presentations we have covered the years 1844 to 1888 and now in this series of justification by faith we want to pass 1888 and come to the present times that we are living in and how our doctrines have been affected and how the doctrine of justification by faith has been lost sight of by introduction of uh, theories that are contrary to what has been revealed by the Bible and the prophet. And so Minneapolis 1888 and the aftermath, the nature of Christ and uh, the eternal risk. And you shall see at the end that really if Christ had come as God and not a human being, then there will be no eternal risk that will be involved in this. And so for those lovers of history and those who have no interest, I welcome you and those who have lost passion of it that uh, we may learn together. And so the nature of Christ and uh, why should we study about this? Why? continue insisting on the nature of Jesus Christ when it comes to the message of justification by faith. You will find that uh, the messengers of righteousness by faith, E.T. Jones and E.J. Wagona, and Moso E.J. Wagona, whom the prophet spoke about, the prophet of the Lord spoke about now and then. In his introductory notes of 1888, he belabored to set forth the true identity of Jesus Christ 
before he went on to present the message of righteousness by faith. The first six chapters of the book Christ and His Righteousness written by the messenger of righteousness by faith in 1888 who is Elliot J. Wagoner is to do with the nature of Jesus Christ. And then the other seven chapters in that book now deals with the Christ and his righteousness. And this is why these messages have to be again brought unto the congregation so that uh, they may be able to understand why Christ and his righteousness, why is it so important? And they can only understand by also understanding the nature of Jesus Christ. Why this study then? Why this study? In Youth Instructor, October 13, 1898, paragraph six. And uh, I'll quote a lot of E.G. White because I'm dealing with her as a historian and a messenger of the Lord a person who had the true history of what was happening in 1888, and a person who was inspired at the same time to write the things that were uh, affecting Christendom. And so I'm quoting a lot of E.G. White, first of all, as a historian on this matter, and then second, as a messenger, an inspired messenger on this subject. And so looking at uh, Youth Instructor, October 13, 1898, paragraph six, we read this, why study this issue of the nature of Jesus Christ? The humanity of the son of God is everything to us. It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. Contrary to what you hear every now and then that you shouldn't be studying the nature of Jesus Christ, we are told this should be, this is to be our study. And what does this study help us to understand? Christ was a real man. He gave proof of his humility in becoming a man. Yet he was God in the flesh. When we approach this subject, we will do well to heed the words spoken by Christ to Moses at the burning bush. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place where on thou standeth is holy ground. We shall come to this study with the humility of a learner with a contrite heart. And the study of the incarnation of Christ is a fruitful field which will repay the searcher who digs deep for hidden truth. And so the study of the nature of Jesus Christ is a fruitful field of study that will reward the searcher therein. It is not a vain thing to study about the nature of Jesus Christ. And so don't be intimidated with the people who say that you are belaboring to study this subject. What profit is it that you'll get out of it? We are told that the study will repay the searcher with who digs deep for hidden truth. Continuing on, we are told uh, a little history, uh, a little, hi little history we are told and this uh, we were able to look at it uh, some time before. Talking about Judson Sylvian, Sylvanus Washburn and the history that uh, was uh, there in 1880. Washburn was the son of Sabbatarian Adventist pioneer Calvin Washburn, who had joined the Adventist movement during the Millerite movement of the 1840s as a youth judge Washburn had many opportunities to meet the founding pioneers of Seventh-day Adventist Church. Washburn claimed a rich SDA heritage. He was converted by Jane Andrews at 11, baptized by James White at 12, and began preaching Adventism at 21. He worked in the Iowa Conference. It was from here that he came as a delegate to the 1888 conference session. The spiritual struggles that occurred at this meeting left him groping about his own spiritual life a problem that he later sorted through by counseling with Ellen White. About this time, he also began a correspondence with Miss White that lasted through the rest of her life until her death in 1915. Rejuvenated spiritually by the message of righteousness by Faith Washburn went as a missionary to England. Up until that time, the work in England had been struggling. 
but uh, his creative tactics for drawing crowds and holding their attention literally changed the face of the church there from a small company of believers so literally hundreds who were converted at a time continued on with this little history there is evidence that british adventism may not have survived but for his contribution as a powerful and creative evangelist in addition to his intense study of the spirit of prophecy and desire to maintain obtain everything that um, sister white wrote washburn's amazing memory enabled him to memorize much of the bible and spirit of prophecy writing by 1918, he claimed to have memorized Revelation, Romans, James, and Second Peter. He noted that his memory improved with the study of the Bible and spirit of prophecy. By 1948, he claimed to have memorized the entire New Testament and was working toward committing Isaiah to prophecy. This is the heritage of Adventism. There is most a remarkable story regarding Washburn 1888 and Ellen White, and we are looking at 1888 and the aftermath, the nature of Christ and eternal risk. And there is a reason why I'm quoting Judson uh, Sylvanus Washburn, because you will find later that he says that um, E.J. Wagoner, uh, Sister White confessed that E.J. Wagoner had been given uh, a clearer way of teaching righteousness by faith. And we shall be quoting some of the statements by E.J. Wagoner and Sister White on this subject. J. Washburn was a nephew of J. George I. Butler, was 26 years old in the year of 1888, the year when Brother Wagona and Jonas delivered to the Adventist Church the special message of righteousness by faith. When he first heard the message, he rejected it because he felt that it was contrary to the established teachings of the Adventist Church concerning the law of God. Thus, he sided with Butler, with Brother Uriah Smith and J. H. Morrison in their disavowal of the doctrine. It was during this time that they first realized that Sister White was in full agreement with Jonas and Wagoner. And we, we, I will quote Wagoner a lot in this uh, in this uh, history of uh, 1888 and aftermath. So it was during this time that uh, he first realized that Sister White was in full agreement with Jonas and Wagoner. This knowledge led him to question Miss White's position as the Lord's special messenger. After a short time of struggle, he met with Sister White and his doubts were dissolved. He later recalled, and this is what I want you to keep in uh, memory as we go through the nature of Christ and the aftermath of 1888. So I went to have a visit with her in her tent at Ottawa meeting. I told her I had always thought and believed that she was a prophet. This is Jadison saying that she, she went to visit E.G. White and told her that she thought she was a prophet. But I was disturbed by the Minneapolis episode. Why be disturbed by Minneapolis episode? Because Sister White was together with Jonas and Wagner on the teaching of righteousness by faith. I had thought that Uriah Smith and J.H. Morrison were right. And Sister White says, do you know why J.H. Morrison left the conference early? She asked me. I replied, yes. Then she told me just what Morrison had said to me and the revelation of her apparently superhuman knowledge of what of that private confidential conversation frightened me. I realized that there was one who knew secret. Sister White told me of her guide in Europe and who had stretched his hands out and said, there are mistakes being made on both sides in this controversy. Then she added that the law in Galatians is not the real issue of the conference, the real issue is righteousness by faith. And uh, there are some whom have requested that we repeat the law of in Galatians because it had so much history and uh, I was going maybe so fast they couldn't grasp what I was saying. And uh, by God's grace, we shall be able to repeat the law of the law in Galatians and how it applied to righteousness by faith and the 1888 messages. So here we are told the issue in the book of Galatians is righteousness by faith. E.J. Wagner can teach righteousness by faith more clearly than I can, said Sister White. What a confession from a prophetess. And J. Uh, Jetson Sylvanus Washburn asked Sister White, uh, why, said uh, Sister White, I said, do you mean to say that E.J. Wagner can teach it better than you can with all your experience? Sister White replied, yes, the Lord has given him special light on that question. I have been waiting, wanting to bring it out more clearly, but I could not have brought it out as clearly as he did. But when he brought it out at Minneapolis, I recognized it. And uh, you remember the statement where she says that uh, uh, 
if he had been teaching uh, righteousness by faith for 45 years, that means from uh, 1843 to 1888. But uh, the people were not getting it. But when it was presented by another, the all of her fiber said, Amen. The only person who could have understood what she was teaching was her husband, whom they had had conversations uh, with her. But uh, people were not understanding it. But when Wagona brought it out, it was a clear teaching to them. And so, um, Wagona, uh, Washburn went away and uh, was able to now side with the prophet on the issue of righteousness by faith and uh, other matters to do with the truth about God and all that stuff. And so the aftermath of 1888 and eternal risk and the nature of Jesus Christ. Now, I just want to go through some uh, history and slides to, for you to see what uh, uh, happened afterward, what the people believed and what happened afterward and uh, what Sister White wrote about after 1888. And uh, all have seen, there, there have been a controversy about Romans chapter three, uh, verse 23 with the all have seen. And we shall be looking at how Sister White quoted it, how we're gonna quoted it, how Jonas quoted it and how Haskell even quoted the, the verse. Because first of all, we have believed in a lot of traditions, I, I must say. When uh, we are talking about uh, uh, Romans 3.23, we always talk about uh, that even include children, but the whole chapter of Romans chapter three doesn't have nothing to do with children. Uh, when you look at it, it is uh, a contrast between the Jewish who know the law and the Gentiles who doesn't have the law. It is about uh, uh, what advantage have the Jewish over the Gentiles who doesn't have the law. Romans chapter three verse 23 has nothing to do with children. Read, I, I, I really challenge everyone to read Romans chapter three in context without reading with traditional lenses of what they have been taught it means with the issue of the born sinners and all that stuff. And somebody will ask me, are children born? Uh, because the, the verse says that all have seen and have fallen short of the glory of God. And if you exclude children, are children born with the glory of God? I say, Children are not born with the glory of God. First of all, if you look at it literally, as Adam and Eve had the glory of God in the book of Genesis chapter one and chapter two, and they lost it in chapter three, children do not have that glory. They have the effect, the consequences of the sin of Adam. And yes, they do not have that literal glory, not because they have sinned, but because Adam lost it and their heritage is that of Adam which means a loss of that external glory. But children have not yet trained their minds to, uh, so that we can say really, they don't have the glory of God because they have sin. They don't have the outside glory because of the consequences. But the children, we cannot say children are born sinners and they are without the glory of God in the inside. The capability to still be accepted in heaven is there. And we know that many children will be in heaven who haven't done good or right, but because that the grace of Jesus Christ covers them. And so let us look at this. The commandments of God are comprehensive. And I want you to look how Sister White used Romans chapter 3, verse 23, not how you, we have been taught traditional about it. The commandments of God are comprehensive and far reaching. In a few words, they unfold the whole duty of man. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thine soul, with all thine mind and with all thine strength. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Tell me how children can have such a, a, a character and attributes when they are just coming from their mother's womb and they are one day old. In these words, and remember, Sister White is quoting Romans chapter three, verse 23, and she is using such a language to surround the verse that we are talking about all have seen. And I want to make it clear children are not born sinners. That is something that uh, we will have to contend with. Children are born on probation. Children have righteousness is right doing. And uh, uh, sin is the 
wrongdoing. And so children are never born righteous. Children are not born sinners. Children are born on probation. They are a gift and a blessing from God and you have to instill in them that which they will be. And so at that point, we can say that children are innocent. They are not righteous. They are not sinners. They are born on probation. They are innocent. They have no consciousness of sin as we shall see later. In these words, the length and breadth, the depth and height of the law of God is comprehended. How can a child comprehend the law of God who is one year old, one, one, one day old? The child doesn't have ears to, to be able to articulate well scriptures and all these things. How can the child comprehend the law of God? For Paul declares love is the fulfilling of the law. Children cannot practice love. I must declare to you, they can recognize the mother and the smile with the mother, but children cannot practice love per se. It is in a limited way because they don't have a, a mind, a developed mind to be able to resonate between things. The only definition we find in the Bible of, for sin is that sin is the translation of the law. How will you include the child in that? The word of God declares all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You see now, Sister White quotes Romans chapter 3 verse 23. And don't forget what she have said in the previous statement. There is none that doeth good, no, not one, Romans 3, 12. Many are deceived concerning the condition of their heart. Uh, is a child deceived con concerning the condition of her heart or his heart? I submit to you that is not applicable by this quote. They do not realize that the natural heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. They wrap themselves about with their own righteousness. The child cannot wrap around itself with righteousness because it doesn't even know what is righteousness and are satisfied in reaching their own human standard of character. A child has no character to be tested. We saw that in, in the previous readings. But how fatally they fail when they do not reach the divine standard and of themselves, they cannot meet the requirements of God. And so you see how Sister White is quoting Romans chapter 23 and uh, expounding on it. It's not like we have been preached to and it's not according to our beliefs. Continued on, we are told still the same Romans 3.23, and uh, I was reading previously from uh, 1SM 320.1, and now look at uh, Faith and Works, page 108, paragraph 1. All have seen. Look how the messenger of the Lord, and I told her I'm using her as a historian, and I'm using her as inspired messenger. With this quote in Romans 3.23, all have seen. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He finds the peace of Christ, for pardon is written against his name and you accept the words of God, you are complete in him. Can a child accept the word of God? Can it comprehend the word of God? How hard is it for humanity long accustomed to cherish doubt, to grasp this great truth, but what peace it brings to the soul, what vital life. It looking to ourselves for righteousness by which to find acceptance with God, we look to the wrong place. And so a child cannot look at itself for finding righteousness and acceptance to God. And then she quotes Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Brothers and sisters, I want you to look at how Sister White uses Romans 3.23. She never uses it on children. She uses them it on adults. And she says, we are to look to Jesus for us we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians 3.18. You are to find your completeness by beholding the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. The last quote she uses, Romans 3.23. It is 1SM 397.4. And here she says, imputation of the righteousness of Christ comes through justifying faith. Now, I want to pause a minute and ask us, does a, a child have faith? Does a one old day child have faith? Faith in what? In parent or in God? The, the child cannot exercise faith in any way because faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God and putting it in, uh, in exercise. Faith is uh, acting on the promises of God, believing that what the word of God has said it will do it. That is what we call faith. Children have no ability to comprehend that. Children newly born can't comprehend such a, 
a, a faith that uh, needs a that uh, accentuates our salvation. He says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. Now, I, I want you to see how again she enjoins these verses. He says, for there is no difference, for all have sinned. For there is no, for there is no, uh, for all have sinned. Uh, let me just repeat. For there is no difference. Difference between who and who. Go back to the book of Romans chapter 3 and look at it. It is between the Gentiles who doesn't have the law and the Jewish who have the law. There is no difference. So the subject matter in Romans chapter 3 is between the Jewish and the Gentiles who doesn't have the law. And she says that there is no difference. Romans, Paul said that. For all have seen and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is Christ in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid ye we establish the law. So the context of Romans chapter 3 won't allow you to include children in that category. Maybe you may use another verse to... Uh, teach a born sinner's doctrine, but Romans chapter 3, verse 23, does not apply to the young children. Maybe bring about another verse that we may discuss or, and see what the Lord says. Then now, uh, 6BC 95.4, if the transgressor is to be treated according to the letter of this covenant, then there is no hope for the fallen race, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The fallen race of Adam can behold nothing else in the letter of this covenant than the ministration of death. Children have no ability to read and write and be able to comprehend what is written in the covenant. And so, and death will be a reward of everyone who is seeking vainly to fashion a righteousness of its own that will fulfill the claims of the Lord. Children do not try to exercise or to fashion righteousness. That one, uh, I don't agree with. By his word, God has bound himself to execute the penalty of the law on all transgressors. Again and again, men commit sin, and yet they do not seem to believe that they must suffer the penalty of breaking the law. In review and herald, March 15, 1906, paragraph 6, all have seen. And I'm coming to the issue of the nature of Christ and the eternal risk. Which nature did he take? If we say that children are born sinners, I don't know how you will exempt Jesus Christ in it. Because I'll, uh, uh, we, we shall see that in order for Christ now to be excluded from children who are born sinners, there's always what people teach, which is so dangerous to our salvation and to the message of righteousness by faith. We read, the wickedness that fills our world is the result of Adam's refusal to take God's word as supreme. He disobeyed and fell under the temptation of the enemy. Sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. God declared. Now, I want you to also look at how uh, Sister White uses this all have sinned in uh, Review and Herald, March 15, 1906, paragraph 6. She says, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for all, for that all men have sinned. So, Yes, we know that one man sinned and death entered into the world. That is the consequences of sin entered into the world. And now even children die because of the consequences. But then she adds that uh, for all, for death passed upon all men for those that all have sinned. And now which death is this that we are talking about? God declares the soul that sinneth it shall die. This is uh, the penalty of death, not now the consequence of uh, sin. When Adam sinned, he passed on his generation the consequences of sin, which is this uh, uh, temporal death asleep in Jesus, if you may say so, the first death. But now Ezekiel adds that the soul that sinneth shall die. 
This is the second death, the penalty of sin. And so children are included in the first death of the consequences of sin, but children are not included in the second death. That is an issue that is left with God. And if you say that children are born sinners, then they are born condemned of the penalty of death before they even do anything. So the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary doesn't cancel anything, but the condemnation of the penalty of sin stands upon children who have not even seen. And how will you read Ezekiel chapter 18, that uh, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And apart from the plan of redemption, human beings are doomed to death. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Christ gave his life to save the sinner from the death sentence. He died that we might live. To those who receive him, he give power that enables them to separate from that which, unless they return to their loyalty, will place them where they must be condemned and punished. So when Adam sinned, we had the consequences of sin, which is death. And then if Christ could have not interposed there, then that consequence could have turned into the penalty. But Christ steps in and saves us from the penalty. So children which are born are born with the consequence of sin, which is the first death, but not with the penalty of death. That is the distinction of what is being spoken in this quote. God declared the soul that sinneth it shall die, Ezekiel 18, 4. And apart from the plan of redemption, human beings are doomed to death. So the the, the consequence of sin, which is death, could have led to the penalty of sin if Christ would have not interposed. The whole race could have been wiped away because now they could be severed from uh, the tree of life, which could give them immortality. And if you don't have immortality, then uh, you are mortal. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Ezekiel 18.4 is quoted alongside Romans 3.23 to show you that this is the penalty of sin and not the consequence of sin. But Christ gave his life to save the sinner from the death sentence. He died that we might live. To those who receive him, he gives power that enables them to separate from that which, unless they return to their loyalty, will place them where they must be condemned and punished. You see Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God deals with the penalty of sin. When it is combined with Ezekiel 18.4, and it doesn't apply to anyone who haven't sinned or have knowledge of sin. Christ is the sinner's only hope. By his death, he brought salvation within the reach of all. Through his grace, all may become loyal subject of the kingdom. Only by his sacrifice could salvation be brought within man's reach. And so it becomes so clearly when uh, looking at this quote uh, and uh, we understand in which condition children are born. And then now we come to the nature of Jesus Christ, how he was born. This is so interesting because I told you we shall be quoting E.J. Wagwana because we, we are told that uh, he was able to be given the gift of teaching this message more clearer than uh, E.G. White was given. And so now let us come to the nature of Jesus Christ. We have seen that all have seen and fall short of glory of God. And Romans chapter three, verse 23 doesn't apply to the children. And so when we are talking about children being born, are they born with the penalty of sin or with the consequence of sin? They are born with the consequence of sin. This is the same way Jesus Christ was born, with the consequence of sin, not the penalty of sin. And so if you say that children are born sinners, it means that they are born with the penalty of sin and Christ can be excluded because look at what the pioneers and even uh, E.G. White use these expressions. Starting with S.N. Haskell in uh, Review and Herald, October 2, 1900. Look at what the pioneers believe. And uh, we are now looking at the nature of Jesus Christ and eternal risk. This is not the way that men will naturally write a history of the ancestors of Christ. Even if we have inherited tendencies and appetites of the worst kind, there is hope. It was Christ through David who said, behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. This states plainly the nature of humanity in which Christ was conceived, hallelujah. This is something, if you quote this verse concerning Jesus Christ in application to Jesus Christ, people can throw stones at you. 
but the pioneers were at liberty to quote this verse in application to uh, Jesus Christ himself. Look at uh, 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 Stephen N. Haskell letter two to Ellen White, dated uh, at Battle Creek, Michigan, September 25, 1900. And Sister White did not write back to S.N. Haskell and condemn him for all that he was saying in 1900. Heskel writes to E.G. White, when we stated that we believe that Christ was born in fallen humanity, they will represent us as believing that Christ sinned. So the children born, born in fallen humanity does not mean they are born in sinners. This is the same nature that Jesus Christ took. And when we say that we do not mean Christ is a sinner, but people will want to make it look like because we are born of Adam, we are sinners. Sin is nature. No, sin is not nature. Sin is something else. It is defined in the Bible. And so S.N. Haskell quotes the book of uh, Psalms. I believe it is the 51st division of Psalms. And then she, he writes to uh, E.G. White of what people were saying about it. E.J. Wagona, this is what he says in Christ uh, uh, and his righteousness. Other scriptures that we will quote bring closer to us the fact of the humanity of Christ and what it means for us. We have already read that the word was made flesh. And now we will read what Paul says concerning the nature of that flesh, the nature of who Jesus Christ himself, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who not after the flesh, but after the spirit, who walk not after the flesh, but the spirit. Wagona continues to say uh, in this, a little thought will be sufficient to show anybody that if Christ took upon himself the likeness of man in order that he might redeem man, it must have been sinful man that he was made like. For it is sinful man that he came to redeem. Death could have no power over a sinless man. As Adam was in Eden and it could not have had any power over Christ if the Lord had not laid on him the iniquity of us all. Moreover, the fact that Christ took upon himself the flesh, not of a sinless being, but of a sinful man, that is, that flesh which he assumed had all the weaknesses and sinful tendencies to which fallen human nature is subject, is shown by the statement that he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. David had all the passions of human nature. He says of himself, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. 51. Five of sons. The following statement in the book of Hebrews is very clear on this point. For verily he took not on his him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. For verily not of the angels doth he take hold, but he taketh hold of the seed of Abraham. This is the revived, revised version. This is E.J. Uh, Wagner in 1890, Christ and his righteousness. This is the book. This is the messages that uh, when Wagner presented actually the fiber of Ellen White said amen to it. Continued in it, uh, she says in Christ and his righteousness, page 27, uh, 2 and 3. If we if he was made in all things like unto his brethren, then he must have suffered all the infirmities and been subject to all the temptations of his brethren. To two more texts that put this matter very forcibly will be sufficient evidence on this point. We first quote. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he, God, had made him Christ to be seen for us who knew no sin, that he might be made the righteousness of God in him. And then he goes ahead to say, this is much stronger than the statement that was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was made to be seen. Here is the same mystery as that the son of God should die. The spotless lamb of God who knew no sin was made to be seen. Sinless yet not only counted as a sinner, but actually taking upon himself the sinful nature. I, I hope you are seeing what we're going to say. And uh, here we have something to ponder about. Talking about shaping iniquity, which nature did Jesus Christ take? And how does this actually uh, affect the message of justification by faith? But we see Jesus was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that by the grace of God should taste death for every man. This text shows that Christ took upon himself man's nature and that as a consequence, he was subject 
to death, not as a penalty, but by partaking of our nature, he had the consequences of death. You see that? So children are born with the consequence of sin. Christ was born with the consequence of sin. Children are not born with the penalty of death. You see now, if you say that the nature is sin, then Christ is included in that. And then if children are born with the penalty of death, then Christ was born with the penalty of death. But Christ was not born by the penalty of death, but he was born by the consequence, the subject to death. That is the consequence of sin. Romans 3, Romans 1, 3, the gospel of God concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. Remember 51, 5 of Psalms, the seed of David. What is the seed of David? What was the nature of David according to the flesh? Sinful. Was it not? David says, behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalms 51, 5. Don't start in a horrified astonishment. I am not implying that Christ was a sinner. So in quoting Psalms 51 verse 5 to apply it to Jesus Christ and to apply it to infants, it doesn't mean that they are sinners. What when I saying that don't get horrified by this? This is not my implication. And he quotes Hebrews 2, 16 and 17, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. I hope these things are resonating with us. In 1888, E.J. Wagona in his sermon, he continues, he being made in all things like unto his brethren in the same as he's being made in the likeness of sinful flesh, made in the likeness of man. One of the most encouraging things in the Bible is the knowledge that Christ took on him the nature of man to know that his ancestors according to the flesh were sinners. And where did he do that? Christ did not come to show man what God can do. Christ came to show man what man can do if he holds the strength, the hand of the omnipotence. We are told in Christ's object lesson, page 333, paragraph one, that his beatings are his enablings. And so he did not come to show what God can do, but what man can do. And Wagona talks about, I say that his being born under the laws a necessary consequence of his being born in the likeness of sinful flesh, of taking upon himself the nature of Abraham. He was made like man, in order that he might undergo the suffering of death, not the penalty of death. From the earliest childhood, the cross was ever before him. And Christ was born subject to death because of the consequence of sin. And then he tested the second death. He tested the penalty. Uh, he, he tested uh, what man could go through if he was alienated from God to save us for those who will accept the righteousness of Jesus Christ and have the character of Jesus Christ. September 20, 1894 by A.T. Jones. And so while talking about uh, Christ being born like human beings, for people wanting to make sin by nature exempt Jesus Christ from this, and uh, why exempt Jesus Christ from this? The opponents of the doctrine Beside declaring it to be unscriptural, asserted that it was absurd and said, on the same principle, you'll be obliged to hold the conception of our ancestors in ascending line was also a holy one, since otherwise you could not have descended from the worldly. So the people who want to say sin is nature would want to exempt Jesus Christ from being born like normal children. And to exempt him from that, they have to bring in another doctrine that Mary had to be exempted from being born like other children. The logic of this objection is apparent and unless met, it will necessitate the immaculate conception. So if Christ would be born not like other children, then what we enter into is what we call immaculate conception. And let us look at this thing about immaculate conception then. We are told of the Mary's pedigree and if Mary was born in immaculate conception, then what do we do with Romans chapter one, verse three, which says that Jesus Christ was born of the seed of David. Then we have to go all the way with immaculate conception, exempt Mary and exempt that lineage and even exempt David because Christ will not come from a lineage that uh, was shapen in iniquity. So in order to head off this fatal logic, some 
one who was born in sin must uh, let her rise above his condition, be freed from human sinful flesh, after which from these superhuman bodies could be born immaculate or sinless flesh. Roman Catholic tradition, which according to the teaching of the church is declared to be more clear and safe than the Bible says that Joachim and Anne were the parents of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And it is by them we are told that the great feat of lifting the ancestry of Mary from sinful flesh to sinless flesh was accomplished. So these parents of Mary who gave birth to the baby Jesus were uplifted from this sin, uh, sinful nature to a sinless nature. And then they were able to conceive Mary and Mary later conceived Jesus Christ. And that is how Jesus Christ is exempted from the normal birth of children. What kind of rubbish and traditions that men will endanger themselves with the doctrine of justification by faith. Of these traditions, parents of Mary, it is stated that they showed themselves always so perfect in their whole conduct that one need not to marvel that from such a perfection should come forth the one whose luster is as the mirror of goodness in ages past and to come. I want you to read what. Uh, uh, it Jonas continues to say about this doctrine that Christ was not born in our nature. And I hope I'm slow enough for you to grasp what we are talking about. It Jonas continues to say, but Saint Anne and Saint Joachim, who are the parents of Mary, the mother of Jesus, were not born sinless, meaning that they were born sinners. How then was this perfection attained? He asked the question. Let the cardinal in those work ask the same question and answer it. By what gradation of virtues and perfection did she send Anne raise herself to make this thing possible? Let us remember what Mary was, let us remember what Mary was from the first instant of her creation. And we shall then be able to form an idea of what must have been her mother. Must not the stem be worthy of the flower and the vase worth of the perfume it contains. On leaving the hands of God, still under the actions of his creating breath, the soul of Mary was joined to most pure body, forever virginal and immaculate like itself. However, holy Joachim and Anwar at the time in their marriage, they were not yet sufficiently so to give such a data as Mary to the world. By multiplying their fasts, by their alms through so many long years in order to obtain this grace from God's goodness, they made rapid progress in perfection and in the love of God, and at length arrived at that degree of purity and holiness desired by the Holy Ghost. Thus, mortification and sacrifice had done their work in St. Anne and St. Joachim, purifying, refining, and not leaving in them even the shadow of defilement. God could take of that pre-sanctified earth to create his well-beloved daughter, who after God sees none superior or equal to herself, either in holiness, in glory, or in power, purer than angels, holier than the archangels. Now you see these absurdities that Mary, by the time she was being born, the parents were so holy that when she was created from the parents, she was pure, equal, superior, non-superior or equal to herself, either in holiness, in glory or power, purer than angels, holier than archangels. Can you, can you imagine this? This is how the doctrine of Jesus Christ not being born in our nature goes as far. That the one who gave birth to, make, to, to Jesus Christ himself was purer than angels and holier than the archangels and still more has to come. We read, but why all these theological disputes and furious contention and purple bulls of anathema and infallible decisions in Roman Catholic Church concerning the immaculate conception of Mary and immaculate spirit of St. Anne and St. Joachim? It was to sanctify the royal blood when our savior was to be born. Mary was declared sinless because the blood transmitted to Mary was from to form the divine flesh. 
Brothers and sisters, uh, I want you to realize what it means by the doctrine of born sinners, the exemption of Jesus Christ from being born our nature, how far it goes. Mary being pure than angels and archangels. And it means that Mary was not born like other children. So men to run away from those, this doctrine that nature is not seen, but translation of the law, they enter into immaculate conception. I know there are people who have been Catholics here and they can resonate with what we are now speaking. St. Anne and St. Joachim are represented as making themselves immaculate because the blood of Joachim and Anne passing through the most pure heart of Mary was to become the blood of Jesus Christ. This exempts Jesus Christ and do, does away with the Bible. After the storm of contention is over and Franciscans and Jesuits have won, the turn of the Vatican finished the creation of the Savior. What do we behold? We see a Savior whose blood was purified by mortification and sacrifice of his grandparents and whose divine flesh was formed by blood made purer than the angels, holier than the angels through his grandmother and grandfathers, multiplying their fasts, their alms and good work. So, the born sinner's doctrine, actually what it drives into is righteousness by works. Because by mortification of their bodies, St. Anne and St. Joachim were able to become so pure and their blood so purified that when the creature who is Mary came out, she was having a divine uh, like body to give out to a divine flesh. Oh, how this frustrates the grace of God, for by grace are we saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you see the doctrine rightly goes into righteousness by works. Again, this unchristian savior is represented as clothed not with the sinful flesh of Abraham, but with divine flesh, purer than the angels and holier than the angels. So at, at the end of the day, you have Jesus Christ who has a divine flesh and not a human flesh. And so we have read this, she, St. Anne, is the mother of her who is purer than angels, holier than the archangels, higher than the thrones, more powerful than the dominions. And then Etijones finishes by saying, away with your Mary ladder and immaculate bridge. Jesus Christ is the ladder and it is lower must run reaches as low as the lowest sinner. In order that he might reach sinful men, verily he took on him the nature of uh, he took on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. For so much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise put, uh, uh, took part of the same. And uh, this is much history, as uh, you can see it, but I, I want to bring it to an end somehow in a, 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 in a good side. And uh, we read what uh, Jonas goes ahead and says, now as to Christ not having like passion with us in the scripture all the way through he is like us and with us according to the flesh. He is the seed of David according to the flesh. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Don't go too far. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, not in the likeness of sinful mind. Do not drag his mind into it. His flesh was our flesh, but the mind was the mind of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus. Therefore it is written, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If he had taken our mind, how then could we ever have been exhorted to let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus? It would have been so already. But what kind of mind is ours? Oh, it is corrupted with the sin also. Look at ourselves in the second chapter of Ephesians, beginning with the first verse and reading to the third. But the third verse is the one that has particular point in it. Now you must distinguish between a brain and a mind. A brain is uh, that fleshy part of human being that is still in its infantry and it can develop. And now when it is developed, it hosts the mind, the very nature of the soul, the very character. And Jesus Christ had the mind that we are told to partake of. He was able to conquer everything that came in his way. And then we are told, let this mind that was in Christ be in you. We are never admonished, let this flesh that was in Christ be, uh, was with Christ be with you. We are told of his mind, let it be in us. When his brain developed, he only uh, accepted the rightful things in his life. And then because 
he submitted in every step to the will of God. He learned obedience as even children learn obedience. And then he was able to die for us and imparts on us the same. Divinity combined with humanity does not sin. Our minds have consented to sin. Consent is to act. We have felt the enticement of the flesh and our minds yielded. So consent is to yield. Our minds consented and did the wills and the desires of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. The flesh leads, our minds have followed. And with the flesh, the law of sin is served. When the mind can lead, the law of God is served. Praise the Lord. But our minds have surrendered, yielded to sin. Something that Christ never participated in. He never yielded to sin. Now the flesh of Jesus Christ was our flesh, and in it was all that is in our flesh. All the tendencies to sin that are in our flesh were in his flesh, drawing upon him to get him to consent to sin. Suppose he had consented to sin with his mind, what then? Then his mind will have been corrupted, and then he will have become of like passion with us. But in that case, he himself will have been a sinner. He will have been entirely enslaved, and we all will have been lost. Everything will have perished. But Christ his mind never consented to it. The flesh had this, uh, 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 had these uh, yearnings. In fact, he says that uh, uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But yet, he doesn't yield his mind to that. And so, what are the issues? Children can partake of the mind of Jesus Christ. Yes. By the upbringing of the children, they can partake of that mind. Seth was of more noble stature than Cain or Abel and resembled Adam more closely than did his other sons. He was of a worthy character following in the steps of Abel. Yet he inherited no more natural goodness than did Cain. Concerning the creation of Adam, it is said, in the likeness of God made he him. But man after the fall begat a son in his own likeness after his image. While Adam was created sinless in the likeness of God, Seth, like Cain, inherited the fallen nature of his parents, but he received also the knowledge of the Redeemer and instruction in righteousness. By divine grace, he served and honored God, just as Jesus Christ honored and served God, as Abel would have done, and he lived to turn the minds of sinful men to revere and obey their creator. But not to any class is Christ's love restricted. Sometimes we hear brethren quote the book of Hebrews chapter 2 and say that uh, it says that uh, he does not fear to call them his brethren and it means sanctified brethren. But look at what Sister White talks in commending on Hebrews chapter 2 about Christ taking the likeness of his brethren. But not to any class in Christ's love restricted. He identifies himself with every child of humanity, not only the sanctified brethren that we might become members of heavenly family. He became a member of the earthly family. He is the son of man and thus a brother to every son and daughter of Adam, not the sanctified ones. His followers are not to feel themselves detached from the perishing world around them. They are a part of the great web of humanity and heaven looks upon them as brothers to sinners as well as to saints. Did you catch that Hebrews 2, talking about Christ taking the nature of his brethren it is sinners and saints that he has to save. The fallen, the erring, and the sinful Christ love embraces and every deed of kindness done to uplift fallen soul, every act of mercy is accepted as done to him. I'll go in finishing to uh, the risk of eternal loss. But uh, allow me to read this. Bear in mind that Christ overcoming and obedience is that of a true human being. In our conclusions, we make many mistakes because of our erroneous views of the human nature of our Lord. Which are these erroneous views? When we give to his human nature a power that it's not possible for man to have in his conflicts with Satan, we destroy the completeness of his humanity. His imputed grace and power he gives to all who receive him by faith. The obedience of Christ to his father was the same obedience that is required of man. So it is error to give Christ a power that any human being cannot have. As God, he could not be tempted, but as a man, he could be tempted and that strongly and could yield to temptations. 
His human nature must pass through the same test and trial Adam and Eve passed through. His human nature was created, it did not even oppose the angelic powers. Did you catch that? The human nature of Jesus Christ did not possess angelic powers. It was human identical with our own. He was passing over the ground where Adam fell. This is Christ triumphant. Page 213, paragraph four. He was now where if he endured the test. So Christ was on trial, Christ was on test. If he endured the test and trial in behalf of the fallen race, he would redeem Adam's disgraceful failure and fall in our own humanity. So Christ was on trial when he came on earth. As Adam was on probation, so Christ was on probation when he came on earth. A human body and a human mind was his. He was born of our bone and flesh of our flesh. He was subject to disappointment and trial in his own home. Among his own brethren, he was not surrounded as in heavenly courts with pure and lovely characters. He was combust with difficulties. He came into our world to maintain a pure, sinless character and to refute Satan's lie that it was not possible for human beings to keep the law of God. Our Lord was tempted as men is tempted. He was capable of yielding to temptation as are human beings. His infinite nature was pure and spotless, but the divine nature that led him to say to Philip, he that had seen me had seen the father also was not humanized. Neither was humanity deified by the blending of union of two natures. Each retained its essential character and propensities. But we here, we must not come, become in our earthly ideas common and but here we must not become in our own ideas, common and earthly, and in our own perverted ideas, we must not think that the liability of Christ to yield to Satan's temptation degraded his humanity, and he possessed the same sinful corrupt propensities as man. No, as he possessed this flesh that we have, it never consented to sin. And then, so he never possessed the same sinful corrupt propensities. We possess the same by involving ourselves in sin. Look at this, the divine nature combined with the human nature made him capable of yielding to Satan's temptation. Here the test to Christ was far greater than that of Adam and Eve, for Christ took our nature fallen but not corrupted, and will not be corrupted unless he received the words of Satan in the place of words of God. So do you see how our nature is corrupted? It is by doing what? Receiving the words of Satan. And the same could have happened to, Satan, to Jesus Christ. If he could have consented to the words of Satan, then his nature could have been, uh, I mean, uh, he could have possessed fallen propensities. Suppose he was not capable of yielding to temptation places him where he cannot perfect be a perfect example for man and the force and the power of his part of Christ's humiliation, which is the most eventful, is no instruction to help human beings. And so brothers and sisters, what can we say? Uh, I want just to read uh, this. The taking of the human nature of the sinful flesh by Jesus Christ when he came on earth put him at eternal risk of imperiling his place in heaven. The human will of Christ will not have led him to wilderness of temptation. You see that? And to be tempted of the devil, it will not have led him to endure humiliation, scorn, reproach, suffering, and death. His human nature shrank from all these things as decidedly as, our shri as ours shrinks from them. Just as we are born with this nature that shrinks from trials, so Christ was born with the same and risked all heaven for our sake. The contrast between the life and character of Christ and our life and character in is painful con to contemplate. What did Christ live to do? It was the will of his heavenly father. Christ left as an example that we will follow in his steps. Are we doing it? The eternal risk, the risk of eternal loss. Who can estimate the value of a soul? Go to get Gethsemane and there watch with Jesus through those long hours of anguish when he sweat as it were great blood, drops of blood. Look upon the savior uplifted on the cross. Hear that despairing cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Look upon that wounded head, the pierced side, the mud feet. Remember that Christ risked all by taking this nature that we have, 
Christ restored. Tempted like us we are, he staked even his own eternal existence upon the issue of conflict. Heaven itself was imperiled by Jesus Christ taking upon this nature. Heaven itself was imperiled. Remember, we are talking about the nature of Jesus Christ and now uh, immaculate conception, justification by faith and the eternal risk. What did Jesus Christ risk? If you want to know the love of God upon humanity and the imputation of justification or the imputation of his righteousness, look at the nature that Jesus Christ took. He risked all. He imperiled his place in heaven. This is what his justification is all about. Heaven itself was imperiled for our redemption. At the foot of the cross, remembering that for our sin, for one sinner, Jesus will have yielded up his life. We may estimate the value of the soul. In taking upon himself man's nature in its fallen condition, Christ did not in the least participate in its sin. He was subject to the infirmities and weaknesses by which man is compassed, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took off infirmities and bare our sickness, Matthew 8, 17. He was touched with the feeling of our infirmities and was in all points tempted like we are. And yet he knew no sin. He was the lamb without blemish and without spot, 1 Peter 1, 19. Could Satan in the least particular have tempted Christ to sin? He would have bruised the Savior's head. And what is that? As it was, he could only touch his heel. Had the head of Christ been touched, how does the head of Christ be touched if he participated in sin? The hope of the human race would have been have perished. Now listen to this statement. Divine wrath would have come upon Christ as it came upon Adam. Christ and the church will have been without hope, brothers and sisters. This is the risk of eternal loss, Christ taking our nature and then living a victorious life and then giving us back that life by justification, by faith, so that we may be inheritors of eternal life. But although Christ's divine glory was for a time veiled and slipped by the hum his, his assuming humanity, yet he did not cease to be God when he became man. The human did not take the place of the, the divine or the divine of human. This is the mystery of goldness. Two expressions, human and divine, were in Christ closely and inseparably one, and yet they had distinct individuality. Though Christ humbled himself to become man, the Godhead was still his own. His deity could not be lost while he stood faithful and true to his loyalty. So read with me, his deity could not be lost while he stood faithful and true to his loyalty. So the deity of Jesus Christ could have been lost if he was disloyal. Do you see how this was eternal risk? And why would he would have his uh, godhood or deity lost? The risk was taking of this nature that we have and then coming to live as a man. Along the way he could have seen and his deity could have been lost, imagine. And this is how we know that the deity of Jesus Christ was given to him by the Father, rather than he was God of his own. He was given something and he could have lost it if he participated in sin. Trinity is a, a very dis, deceitful doctrine because it doesn't understand the underlying points even of the humanity of Jesus Christ in partaking of the sinful nature. When Christ took the sinful nature, his deity was put at risk. He could have lost it because if his uh, human flesh could have participated in sin. Surrounded with sorrow, suffering, and moral pollution, despised and rejected by the people to whom he had been entrusted the oracles of heaven, Jesus could yet speak of himself as the son of man in heaven. He was ready to take once more his divine glory when his work on earth was done. Last two slides. For a period of time, Christ was on probation. He took humanity on himself to stand the test and trial which the first Adam failed to endure. Had he failed in his state, oh, yeah. test and trial, he would have been disobedient to the voice of God and the world would have been lost. 
Christ being part of the world, everything will have been lost. This is the risk of eternal loss. And yet we hear that Christ took a divine nature. If really he took the divine nature when he came on earth, then friends would not have the risk of eternal loss. And then justification is of no value because nothing was risked for our redemption story. And we read this. And so I'll end with this slide. Why this study? You have seen all what he talks about, Romans chapter 3, Psalms 51, Immaculate Conception, and then we have come to the eternal risk. Why study this, all this? I'll end as I, I started. The humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. It is the golden chains that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. There's no link between us to God, but the humanity of Jesus Christ. This is to be our study. Christ was a real man. He gave proof of his humility in becoming a man, yet he was God in the flesh. And this God, Godhood or deity could have been lost. When we approach this subject, we will do well to hear the word spoken by Christ to Moses, the burning bush. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where on thou standest this holy ground. We should come to this study with the humility of a learner, with a contrite heart, and the study of the incarnation of Christ is a fruitful study, it is a fruitful field, which will repay the searcher who digs deep for hidden truth. I uh, really thank God that uh, he can make us see this truth clearly and see what was imperial at Calvary, see what actually Christ took upon himself, what he risked for even our redemption. And when we have understood this, then we will learn to appreciate the nature of Christ more than we ever appreciated it. Otherwise, I just pray that uh, the blessing of the Lord may be with us as uh, we study this. May we approach it with uh, uh, a humble mind. May we approach it as a, a people who will want to be benefited rather than just have disputes and see the profit that uh, it will give to our lives. Other than that, let us have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, how I want to say so, thank you so much for taking us through this study. It can be so much time consuming and much historical background. But Lord, you say that the study of the incarnation, the human nature of the son will reward the researcher. In it is a golden chain link between humanity and God. We thank you for everything and we thank you for teaching us in Jesus name, amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. I've seen it, I've taken your 17 minutes in this, but uh, I pray that uh, we will be blessed by everything. If uh, there's anything, we can go ahead and uh, ask or contribute to the study. Junior Sirungu, Righteousness by Works, right there by A.T. Jones. Welcome, Brother Zadok. I see you have uh, your image on. <laughs> no, Thank I'm you. Just, welcome. I'm just praising the Lord, my brother, because welcome, brother. Of, uh, of the study. Uh, I am learning a lot and just praising the Lord for what he has been able to share to us through you today. I just wanted to add, maybe to be able to make it a uh, a uh, little bit simpler for us. Uh, uh, the issue of uh, sin and the nature of Christ, I think,
and that in studying it, you will be more clear as you've been able to cite in your first slide and in your ending slide. I was just taking a few notes as, as you are you actually doing the study. And one, if uh, we have a wrong definition of sin, then we cannot have a right estimate of the sinfulness of sin. And uh, I am beginning to realize that if sin is our nature, then I do not think that we need a savior. And if Christ is not come in the nature with the spirit of prophecy and the Bible has uh, described him to have come, taking our fallen human nature, then I think we don't have an high priest, we don't have a savior, and so there is no sanctuary, and therefore there is no atonement. Because the high priest that the Bible describes that is come so that can take the place of the Levitical priesthood is one who is actually has actually taken the flesh of his brethren. And if truly there is no atonement, then there is no perfection of Christian character. There is no perfection of Christian character, then we know that there is no need of probation because probation is given to us to develop a Christian character. And so what you've shared is just bringing me to a point of actually thinking of how dangerous this teaching is and how important the light that you have been sharing. I've not been able to always be here like last Sabbath I was having some, uh, uh, our church here, but truly this is so important that our people should understand the nature of Christ and uh, the danger that has slipped in among us God's people since the 1950s when people publicly began changing, uh, the denomination began changing its position on who Christ is. I also wanted to say, and uh, I've noted that when we have a wrong definition of sin and see sin as a state or sin as a, rather our nature, then it will only call for us to dismantle the old sanctuary service. Because the sanctuary states to us that the sinner was to lay his hand upon the lamb the innocent lamb and confess their sin, which were their actions, choices that they had made, which were contrary to the law of God. The sinners were not to confess the nature in which they were born. They were to confess the choices, the actions that they made either in thought against the lowest definition. If the sinners were basically to confess their nature, then it means they would leave the sanctuary courtyard with a different nature. For what they confessed, they left in the sanctuary to be uh, in the courtyard, in the blood, to be transferred to the sanctuary. It will only mean that in a way without saying, those who subscribe to the dangerous heresy and doctrine would actually suggest that when a sinner leaves the courtyard, he lives with a different nature, which is actually close to what happened in Indiana, which led us to the Holy Flesh movement. And you can be able to see where we are directed as a people of God, when we have a wrong understanding of sin, nature of sin, and the nature of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so that would lead us to a false gospel. And it will bring us to a point where 
we'll be asking ourselves a lot of questions which I believe uh, Brother Sami has asked, has, has dealt with rather, because I remember you talked about the Immaculate Conception. You talked about quite a lot of things are going on within the fallen, uh, uh, within the Roman system that have actually uh, been slipped in, but especially from the evangelicals, loudly from the evangelicals. I think the evangelicals are even more loud. The Jesuits are very loud in teaching a wrong nature of Jesus Christ. And we are seeing it slipping in. I think that uh, I just wanted to encourage that as a people, these presentations, we should revisit. We should study for ourselves to know what the points of our faith have been for the past many years that we stood upon the platform of the three angels' messages, the truth as it is in the word of God. What constituted the 1888 message? Because what I'm seeing, and uh, I know that all of those of us who are here, I don't know whether it is this weekend or last weekend, Brother Sam, you might not know. I know that there's a conference that should be going on that is teaching this same subject that Brother Sami has labored to teach in regard to the 1888 message. But in my interaction with those or one of the people who are doing the studies there is, uh, I don't know whether it's now a professor, but it's been a dean And I've interacted about what now the Lord has been able to teach us. What they are pushing home is a wrong thing. Make sin, let's say, what prophecy does not teach it to be, and therefore reads us of a savior. And you know what? where that one has brought us to, a seven-day Adventist. We've come to a point where we do not believe that we can perfect Christian character while we are still on this world. I think according to those evangelicals, the book, Questions and Doctrines of Fundamental Beliefs have achieved the purpose for which the, 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 the compilers are intended that it should achieve, and that is to lead souls astray. May the Lord continue to bless all of us. Brother Sam is continue to labor to make this to explain. And let us publish these doctrines or these teachings far and wide and share with friends documents to know what is the truth. God bless you. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Zadok. Uh, I just wanted to bring this uh, that uh, I did not put in the slide that should be there in the slide. Uh, sin cannot be nature. If sin could be nature, then this quotation will not apply in any way uh, to, to the issue of conversion. What happens at conversion? Conversion does not create new faculties. The spirit of God does not create new faculties in the converted man, but works a decided change in the employment of those faculties. When mind and heart and soul are changed, man is not given a new conscience, but his will is submitted to a conscience renewed, a conscience whose dormant sensibilities are aroused by the working of the Holy Spirit. This is Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 692, paragraph 3. So you see that here it is not nature which is being changed, but actually the, uh, the dormant sensibilities and the conscience deadened by the effects of sin is now renewed. So man retains the same nature but uh, the susceptibility of uh, the understanding and how to do things is what is renewed, is what is changed. Think about this. If you make Christ have a different nature, then there's no eternal risk. Then means, it means that Christ was playing to be man, but he was not man. Hence, justification by faith becomes a role play as even Trinity is a role play. And then Christ could have not lost his deity, which means that Christ was a God of his own. All the things that has to do with the eternal risk are swept aside. Thank you so much. There's a question there on tendency. Maybe you could say something about it. Ansi has uh, some uh, inputs on the comment. She was, uh, I don't know if it's he or she, uh, He said that is indeed pure righteousness by works and there is nothing like that even in history. Yes, I have been a Catholic and that is what we were taught. 
Does the conference church also teach the sinless flesh of Christ? Yes, look at the doctrines, uh, questions on doctrines. Uh, there's a lot that uh, has gone on in 1950s. Uh, you can revisit the sermon by uh, Elder Dan, which uh, speaks about little foxes. We can make it available so that you may go through it and what came in uh, uh, Evangelical Conference of uh, 1950s. Uh, answer yes, that is from Zadok. Uh, yeah, yes, and more than the conference. Uh, and now seeing why there is no life in the church. Then now uh, we have no wonder faith is not emphasized when do we get sinful tendencies? When we do we get sinful tendencies? We have uh, what we call inherit, inherited tendencies and um, cultivated tendencies. Yeah. And so in inherited tendencies, we have uh, what about the sinful tendencies? Talk more about it. Yeah, the errors that we're gonna head when we reach uh, at the presentation extreme uh, views on sanctification, we shall see the errors that uh, we're gonna head. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the sinful tendencies. We have what we call inherited tendencies, where actually we have the effects of uh, uh, the fall in the Garden of Eden, where we have the weak flesh that is uh, clamoring upon doing evil. Uh, these are inherited tendencies. This is the nature that we inherit. But when we yield to sin, then uh, there is what we call the sinful tendency. Sin becomes something which is normal in our lives. And so in the, uh, our human nature itself is not sin. And uh, the urge of flesh to do something actually shows just the power that is struggling within humanity but that is not sin. Sin is the yielding itself because we, we find that Christ inherited these tendencies yet not fallen. And how could he fall if he accepted the words of Satan himself? And so this is not an issue that is so big to uh, be defined. It is true that uh, we have all we inherit from Adam after, uh, after the fall is this tendencies, the weakness of the flesh we find being drawn to sin. But now we do not have to fall to those weaknesses of the flesh. Our mind, then our conscience renewed to Christ. And there is where we, we, we talk about the upbringing up of the child. A child can be brought up in the way of the Lord until even at the younger age, the child resists these clamorings of the flesh and not turn into the sinful tendencies or uh, cultivated tendencies of sin. So yes, I agree we inherit fallen nature, which have fallen tendencies, but this is not sin. Sin is only when you come and yield to the, uh, 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 to the flesh. And so we are admonished in the book of Galatians chapter, uh, chapter five, is it 5.16? Uh, that um, walking in the spirit and will not gratify the sinful lust of the flesh. And so these are the tendencies that we are born with. But when we yield, it becomes sin. Uh, somebody to look for me that verse. Uh, it, is, it should be in, uh, in the book of uh, Galatians, I believe. Walking in the spirit. Galatians. Five sixteen. This is it. I'll just put it on the screen. So that uh, we, we, we may talk uh, just briefly on it and then uh, the Lord will bless us. And thank you, my wife was uh, helping me look for it. Look, look here at the screen. We are told this say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now they are lust of the flesh, but they will always be there for we are told that work out your salvation with fear and trembling, struggling over mastery, 
of the lust of this flesh. The flesh is always weak. But when we are submitted to the uh, conscience of the spirit, to the renewed spirit, then we cannot fulfill the lust. If we are not fulfilling them, they are there, but they are dormant. When we yield to them, they become sinful. It becomes sin to us. For the flesh lusted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And they are contrary one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would. So if the flesh takes the precedence, the inherited evil tendencies then becomes cultivated evil tendencies and we become sinners. Yet, if you continue walking in the spirit, these lusts are there. The flesh continues to be weak because sin is not nature. The nature, you are still retaining the sinful nature. And what does it mean a sinful nature? A sinful nature is a nature which is subject to sin, which has the weakness, which has been degenerated. But then you are walking according to the spirit. And so the flesh is not yielding. The passions are there, but the spirit is not yielding. But if you be led by the spirit, you are not under the law, which means you are not condemned because of these passions that are there and you have not yielded to them. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are this, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness. Now you have to understand what verse 19 is saying. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. What does it mean to manifest? Is to be outworked. The things that are in you becomes works. They are manifested. And so what are these pullings of the flesh? When they are manifested, they are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murderings, drunkenness, etc. These are manifestations of a flesh which has yielded to inherited tendencies of sin. Now they become cultivated tendencies of sin. And now verse 22 says, but the fruit of the spirit, it cancels. The person who is yielding to the spirit has love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness. But the person who is yielding to the flesh has the above things named. So you find that the flesh has all these things, but it's only when you yield unto them that they become sin. If you continue in the spirit, they are not sin. That is the far I can go, but I know in the next uh Five presentations we shall be able to deal with these verses fully. I don't know, Ansi, if uh, we are somewhere. Okay, thank you. I have I've seen your answer. So I'll be able to deal with the extreme. Uh, views on sanctification, how actually Jonas and Wagona were able to be dragged by uh, Dr. Kellogg and uh, Prescott and all this whole flesh movement. And they started uh, espousing these doctrines of uh, the holy flesh. But um, I, I don't see it uh, actually so necessary until uh, unless it is necessary on the extreme views of sanctification, maybe I can just provide slides later, but I'll be dealing with this issue of uh, uh, 1888 and the aftermath and the nature of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, if there's no other question, we thank the Lord. Uh, Brother Sami, yes, just, just one more, and I praise the Lord for uh, what you have uh, given. Um, maybe I could just add uh, uh, chapter number one verse 14 chapter number one verse 14 of james where it speaks about the same thing that you've explained from galatians when it's drawn away from of his own last and is enticed every man but verse 15 James, in inspiration, thanks for that. James says that then when the last art conceived, what does it mean to conceive? It bringeth forth sin. How does the how does last conceive? The 
question that I'm asking myself in the study of that chapter. When it is cherished, when it is sanctioned, when it is given an okay, when we rejoice in that last, that is what it means when that last had conceived it bringeth forth sin. That last must be cherished. It must be given an opportunity to develop into sin. When it is finished, then sin bringeth forth death. I am impressed by what uh, is written by uh, one of the brethren where he says, Christ was stuck with the feelings of our infirmities because he was in all points tempted like as we are. But when he was tempted, he felt the desires and the inclinations of the flesh precisely as we feel them when we are tempted. For every man is tempted when that man is drawn away of his own lust. You must be drawn away of your own lust or his own desires or his own inclinations of the flesh. And that man is enticed. That's what the Bible says. Now, all this Jesus could experience without doing or committing sin. Christ could experience the, what I've mentioned without doing or committing sin because to be tempted is not sin. Just like you've mentioned about nature not being seen. It is only when last art conceived, when the desire is cherished, that is when inclination is sanctioned, only then it is that it brings forth sin. Now, this, one of these Adventist pioneers says, Jesus never even in a thought cherished a desire or a sanction or sanction an inclination of the flesh. It never, Christ never gave any lust of the flesh an opportunity to conceive. Thus in such flesh as ours, he was tempted in all points as we are. He was drawn in all points as we are, yet without a taint of sin. Why was Christ without a taint of sin? Thus by divine power, that he received through faith in his father, he in our flesh utterly quenched every inclination of the flesh. He quenched it. I would say he starved it. How do you starve inclinations of the flesh? You don't give it the food that it needs to grow. You don't give it the conditions. You don't cherish it. You don't entertain it. You starve it to death. How do you start it to death? By continual surrender to the will of God through faith in God, in Christ. And effectually killed it at its root, every desire of the flesh. And that is why the Bible says Christ condemned sin in the flesh. He did not sin because he did not allow his weak human nature to stray and for, so that he could fulfill the desires of the flesh. And in so doing, Christ brought himself in complete victory. And so divine power to maintain that example, that experience is given to every soul in this world. Now listen to what he says. All this Christ did that he might be an example for us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And so I feel that when I look at that verse, first James, rather James chapter one, I am just amazed at what God is saying. We are not to cherish, we are not to sanction, we are not to feed the tendencies we are to starve them. We're talking about inherited tendency. You're talking about cultivated tendency. We are not to cultivate. What does it mean to cultivate? If you are a farmer, you have to put fertilizer, you have to put all these things. We are not to cultivate them. 
we are daily to starve the tendencies we have towards sin. We are daily to starve them. And how do we starve them? It's not bound strength by continual steps to Christ, continual surrender of our will to Christ. And Ellen White says we cannot give it, but we can ask God to take it because it is his. And then we cannot give our hearts. And then we can cry to God and ask him, creating us a new heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within us. Uh, that's what I wanted to ask. Thank you, Brother Zadok. Thank you so much, Brother Zadok. Uh, as uh, the, the, the PDF uploads and people take it, I have already uploaded it. I think people can see it. I'll just share this in parting as people download it. It's, it, it's, uh, it has a lot of images, so it is uh, 72 MB. So I'll give people a chance to download it as I share this last sentiment. No one looking upon the child like countenance, shining with animation could say that Christ was just like other children. And we don't have to be like other children. He was God in human flesh. That is divinity combined with humanity. And this power he can be given. When urged by his companions to do wrong, divinity flashed through humanity and he refused decidedly. So Christ was urged to do these things. In a moment, he distinguished between right and wrong and placed sin in the light of God's commandments. That is what we are supposed to do as children of God. Be able to distinguish between right and wrong and place sin in the light of God's commandment. Holding up the law as the mirror which, reflect, which reflected light upon wrong, which means that sin is transgression of the law. It was this keen discrimination between right and wrong that often provoke Christ's brothers to anger. Yet his appeals and entreaties and the sorrow expressed in his countenance revealed such a tender, honest love for them that they were ashamed of having tempted him to deviate from the strict sense of justice and loyalty. Youth Instructor, September 8, 1898, paragraph 10. You can see that even his brothers tempted him to deviate from the strict sense of justice and loyalty. But he could put everything in the light of the commandments of God because he knew that uh, transgression against the commandment is sin and not the nature itself. So thank you, brethren. Uh, thank you, Ansi. I hope uh, Junior Sirung also you have taken the slide and I pray that we continue studying as uh, we wait upon the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we meet the next Sabbath, we will be able to go to another step in the nature of Christ. I want just to hear that, uh, Junius, you have uh, taken it. Yes, thank you so much. I have seen the chat and you have taken it. I know other brethren, I send them the link to be able to download it. So goodbye, God bless you and uh, have a, a good evening as we continue to uh, hear from the Lord this Sabbath. Bye.